Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining for today's global lecture series featuring Dr. Emmett Riley. Dr. Riley, I think it is 11 o'clock. We can get started. Let me go ahead and do a uh, quick uh, introduction to you. Is this a good time, Dr. Riley? Yes, this is perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Dr. Emmett Riley is an associate professor and the director of Africana Studies at DePaul University in Greenscale, Indiana. He's also a contributing faculty member in the political science department. Dr. Riley earned, uh, earned a bachelor's degree in English and a bachelor's degree in political science in 2008 at Mississippi Valley State University. He received a master's degree in political science from Jackson State University in 2010. Dr. Riley continued his education at the University of Mississippi, where he earned a master's and doctoral doctor, doctorate of philosophy in political science with a specialization in American politics and international relations in 2014. In today's session, Dr. Riley will be uh, talking about understanding the uh, links between racial oppression in South Africa and the United States. Dr. Riley, we highly appreciate you joining uh, our global le lecture series. Thank you for your time. And I will give control uh, to you for you to share the screen. Let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you uh, for that introduction and give me a moment while I share uh, my screen uh, so that people can see uh, the presentation. I want to take uh, this opportunity to um, thank all of you all for inviting me. A special thanks goes to uh, the Vice President of Academic Affairs, uh, Dr. Kathy Golden. Uh, who invited me to uh, speak for this lecture series. It's also good to be home. Uh, so much of who I am is because of my time spent at Mississippi Valley State University. And for that, I am forever grateful and indebted to uh, my home department, the social science department, and the Department of English and Foreign Languages. Uh, so many great professors uh, that I studied under while I was a student at Valley. And I'm uh, immensely proud and appreciative of the support that the university has given me over the years as I've uh, made strides in my own profession. Um, as part of the lecture series, uh, I've been also asked to talk to students about the uh, importance of study abroad programs in international studies. I know Dr. Godin, when I was a student at Valley, uh, ran the international studies program. And while I did not take advantage of the opportunities what, that were presented to me to study abroad. I regret that. And it was when I really became uh, on tenure track that I started to travel internationally and that I started to, uh, to, to explore the world. And I teach a winter term course on South Africa. Um, and my winter term course is co-taught with Clarissa Peterson, who is a professor of political science and Africana studies at DePauw. She's actually joined join me today for support. So I do appreciate my, my colleagues uh, supporting that. Uh, but uh, we co-teach this course. And one of the things that we're interested in in our South Africa course is what are some important links between uh, race in South Africa and the way race operates in the United States. I am an Americanist who studies race within the American context. Um, uh, uh, in my own profession. And so studying race in South Africa was a little different, but as we prepared the course materials, we started to notice some stark differences and, and also some interesting and complex ways in the which race operates um, as a force in South Africa. So an overview of where we're going today, I'm gonna to talk about the United States and South Africa. I'm gonna talk about understanding white supremacy, white supremacy as an ideology. We're gonna talk about some of the theoretical grounding of this work. And so looking at the apartheid system versus the system of segregation in the United States, uh, poverty, the land, the uh, violence, the debates about land, and the role of anti-Black racism, I think that in order for us to really understand and grapple with what is happening in South Africa and the United States, 
that we've got to really unpack the role of anti-Black racism and the way anti-Blackness uh, perpetuates and, and changes over time and impacts the way in which Black people all across the globe are treated because of this social construct that has been created around racial identity. And so when we begin to compare Af South Africa to the United States, the dynamics are very, very different, but also similar in some starking ways. For example, in South Africa, black, the Black population comprises of a majority of individuals and whites are a minority. Versus here in the United States, um, versus here in the United States, um, Blacks are a majority, are a minority, and whites are a majority, although a shrinking majority when we begin to look at the census data. When we look at uh, the impact of colonialism, of imperialism, uh, in terms of its conquest and its contemporary impact on South Africa, uh, we see it playing out in a similar manner. And oftentimes we talk about racism and anti-Blackness within the context of race having consequences for uh, the for black people, but it's also important to think about also the way in which racism, anti-blackness and the and, and, and the shameful history of colonialism has instilled in some black people this sense of self-hate. And so you know when we go there, we're, we're there as, as as a group with 25 students for about two or for about three weeks, maybe four. Um, we are, we, we're also social observers. And so we observe the way in which the races interact socially. We observe the way in which uh, there is complexity even within racialized communities of, of the different racial identities that are there. And so um, one of the things that is important is that W.B. Du Bois writes The Soul of Black Folk. Uh, and in this particular work, he talks about what does it mean to be a problem? And he predicted that the problem of the 21st century would be the color line. And rightfully so, we see that his postulation more than 100 years now still is prevalent within American society. Um, and this is a problem, not just in America, but a problem globally because of the way in which we have set up uh, white, uh, the way in which white supremacy has influenced us. And so out of the black intellectual tradition, is this question and this quest for uh, for is this question and this quest for black liberation uh, that we see happening in society? So give me a minute to make sure that my screen is sharing because I want to make sure that you are able to see some of the presentation. So hold one moment, please. We we can see see. Oh, you can see. It. Okay, great, great, great. I wasn't sure if you could see. It, so great. Um. So. As I was saying, um, so these two countries sets up an interesting dynamic to really study and unpack this idea of race. Black people all across the globe are inherently linked by what Michael Dawson calls linked fate. This idea that what happens to a black person at one place in the globe will happen, can happen to another black person anywhere. So is this shared sense of oppression so that when we see and unpack uh, apartheid in South Africa and we compare it to uh, chattel slavery in America, the Jim Crow system, the system of segregation in the South, we see starking similarities, but there are also some, some interesting differences that we're gonna talk about um, today. I wanna start off with a video uh, where uh, Toni Morrison, uh, well, 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 first we're going to talk about this video in South Africa, which sort of contextualizes a lot of what's happening. So I'm going to play this video now, and um, here we go. It's racist past me. South Africa's struggle to deal with its racist past may actually hold some very significant lessons for us here in the United States. This is a report by Deborah Pata. She's in Johannesburg, and she takes a look at how the nation faced the trauma and how it continues to tackle it moving forward. 
This is Constitutional Hill. It used to be a prison where former President Nelson Mandela was held during his treason trial. He believed that no one was born hating another person because of their race. And despite 27 years behind bars, he forgave his jailers and tried to reconcile this country after decades of brutality. This is what state-sanctioned police killings looked like under South Africa's racist regime. Known as the Trojan Horse Massacre, white policemen hid inside wooden crates and opened fire on unarmed protesters, killing three of them, the youngest, an 11-year-old boy. The incident was captured by CBS News in an age before cell phone cameras. This type of brutality was rarely caught on film. So hold on one moment. People are saying they can't see the video. Yeah, I think video is on a different screen, I believe. When you share the presentation, we may have to change the screen. Okay, so let me stop real quick. My apologies for that. Just work with me in, in, in this era of Zoom. So here we go. Can we see Which it now? is why over yeah. three decades later, the police killing of George Floyd still takes an emotional toll on black South Africans who find themselves reliving the trauma of apartheid, which legalized systematic and violent racism. That system was eventually dismantled in 1994 through a negotiated settlement. Let freedom reign. Under former President oh, Nelson Mandela, God. the country My began God. a process of truth-telling in a bid to heal the wounds of its racist past. Thank you. May be seated. For seven years, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was broadcast regularly on national television, led by Nobel Peace Laureate Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who spoke to 60 Minutes' Bob Simon. It's, it's not easy to, to open the wounds. It's very painful. But if, if you don't want them to fester, you must open them and cleanse them. Help me, God. Thank you. You may be seated. Perpetrators like Dirk Kutsia, the leader of a state-sponsored death squad, were given amnesty in exchange for the truth. He told 60 Minutes how they routinely murdered black activists. You guys were playing God. Uh, we, we were God. They had pulled all his hair out. The survivors of these unspeakable atrocities were promised reparations. Then they went about cutting his fingers off. More than 21,000 victims testified. Even Tutu broke down and wept. Former anti-apartheid campaigner Reverend Frank Chikani nearly died after being poisoned by the apartheid government. He forgave his perpetrator. Bitterness destroys you. It doesn't destroy the person who cost you the pain. But he has not forgotten. Forgiving doesn't mean forgetting. Um, the guy who tortured me is still the guy who tortured me. It doesn't change. But my attitude against him becomes completely different. The process was flawed. Many victims felt cheated out of justice, but it did open up a national dialogue in which white South Africans could no longer deny the crimes committed in their name. And 26 years later, race remains the enduring fault line of this country's discourse. We have more conversations about race. Race is a conversation that never ends in our country. Patamedi Labia believes South Africans are better at talking about race than Americans, but reconciliation is hard if, like him, you live in a township where some residents still don't have electricity. How do you forgive if you're still hungry? There's still this thing that stands before me, this blackness that hinders me in everything I do. How do I then, even as a new generation, say, we forgave? You're listening to it's uh, an issue uh, radio uh, talk show host uh, Eusebius Makaiser confronts uh, regularly on his show. Continue. I've heard you say that you're tired of white people coming to you and saying, What must I do? How can I be better? How can I, you know, whatever? It's like white people need to do the work themselves. As a black person, as a black thinker, you are expected to be the go to person for solutions on the race question, and that is that is a problematic because if racism is relational, then it actually means that white people are as fluent in racism as black people. After all, it takes two to tango badly. McKaiser says white South Africans need to figure out for themselves how to change. And a good place to begin 
is with the fact that this country's economy is still in the hands of a white minority 26 years after the end of apartheid. That really is the 1994 sin, was to decouple the racism conversation from the economic justice conversation. So what can be learned from this country's truth-telling? There is no quick fix. Some South Africans believe the U.S. would benefit from a similar process. And everyone agreed that you have to keep on having uncomfortable conversations, but that reconciliation is only possible if it's accompanied by economic justice. Vlad and Marie. So this particular video uh, sets up uh, the context of, of the discussion uh, of, the, of this presentation. I think that we can't talk about um, the, we can't talk about justice and equality with respect to South Africa without talking about the ways in which uh, apartheid has structured the current system in South Africa in the same way that we see segregation and, 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 and chattel slavery predicting the plight of African Americans here in America. And so as we think about these particular things, it's important that we unpack just how pervasive apartheid was, but that it impacted every single aspect of South African life in terms of, uh, 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 of where people could live, families being ripped apart. We see segregated beaches. We see uh, the, the, the employment of violence on uh, black communities almost in a very brutal way. We see, and, 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 and we also see too uh, the manifestation of uh, 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 of the legacy of apartheid happening both in the policing system, both here in the United States and also in South Africa. There is this picture in the middle of the presentation of a young African woman who is holding a toddler and she's been arrested by two black officers. And so when you're having discussions in South Africa about race, it becomes complex because their understanding of racial categories differ from the way we understand them or talk about them in the US. For example, um, in South Africa, Afrikaans are considered to be white, uh, people of Dutch descent. Uh, black folk are tied to tribes. Uh, we, then there's a category of coloreds where who are mixed race people, light skin. And so the government sets up these different categories, right? And then you create policies that relegate certain groups and treat certain groups in a different way based off of their their based off of where they identify in that structure. And so all of this is inherently tied to white supremacy as a global force. So when we think about white supremacy, we think about the Klan, we think about the very fine people in Charlottesville, we think about the folk who are attempted in the United States a couple of weeks ago to take over the United States Capitol. But we also got to unpack that white supremacy is first and foremost an ideology. It's an ideology that's rooted in the supremacy of white people, it, and it shows itself up in very different ways. So I show this particular um, pyramid of white supremacy, which shows the different levels and the way in which it takes place. White supremacy, we've got to disbunk this idea that white supremacy is only the Klan, is only the use of racial epithets. White supremacy is an ideology that grip, graps, grapples into our education system, right? Who are we learning about in our courses, in our courses? Are we centering black perspectives? Are we talking about the contributions of black intellectual thinkers to our understanding? Um, who is being served by policies? And what's very interesting about the racial dynamics in South Africa is black people constitute a majority of the population, yet we still see black people disproportionately impacted, both in terms of healthcare outcomes, access to employment, access to proper education. And many of these ideas are expressed in the constitution of South Africa. And so I want to start with Barbara's uh, uh, Theo's definition of race, that race stands for the conception or the doctrine that nature produced human in distinct groups, each defined by inborn traits that his members share and that are differentiated from members of other groups of the same kind. Talking about 
whether it's chattel slavery, whether it's, it, it's white supremacy, apartheid, or whatever element of the globe that we see these elements happening, it's important to understand that in order for, uh, for race to be created as this category where we relegate people to certain statuses based off of that, the moral philosophy for the subligation of Black folk had been written prior. And so Abram Kendi has a book, The History of Racist Ideas, uh, and it's called Stamped from the Beginning. And this particular work documents almost exclusively how we discuss, how race became a social construct and the idea of, of, of racist ideas talking about Africans in sort of this disparaging way and characterizing them. And so I do wanna talk about racism because all too often we refer to racism as uh, the Klan or as someone who's overtly racist, but racism is a thing that white people practice. And it, it is almost, almost like witchcraft. It is a practice that has been embedded into the practice of white people for generations. And many of the actions simply attempt to uphold this particular element. Racism refers to the theory and practice of applying a social, civic, and legal double standard based off of ancestry and to the ideological surroundings of such a double standard. And so when we begin to unpack that racism is a practice, it is a thing that people do. It is actions that white people take that attempts to center themselves as a supreme being. And so if we begin to unpack and understand racism from a systematic standpoint, having conversations about race, whether you're in South Africa or America becomes a little more easier to discuss because we're not talking about individual actions such as overt uses of, uh, of, of, of racial epithets. We're talking about behaviors, policies, practice, and practices and procedures that really, really impact the way in which people function. I wanna show also a small video clip uh, by uh, Toni Morrison, uh, where she is, is, is wrestling with this idea of race. And I'm spending time defining this because it becomes complex. People will say, well, oh, unemployment for Black people can be explained because they're lazy. No, 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 no. You cannot enslave or exclude a group of people for years and then expect them to overnight be on equal footing with white people. It just doesn't work that way. And I think the very suggestion that it does uh, is foolish. And so I'm uh, nod your head if you can see the video that I'm, I'm trying to share uh, because I'm sometimes it's looking like it's not showing up. So I'm about to show this one. And this is Tony Morris. Dominant in our life. We can't see it now. Thank you. It's about feeling good. I mean, racist. You need to feel that you are better than someone. Some and so with every ethnic group that comes to America, oh, it's sure. African Americans who they need to feel better. Oh, yeah, they made some changes, but there was always, in other words, if a German or an Italian or whomever came to this country trying to Americanize himself, he could sort of stay with Germans or stay with Italians or stay with Irish people, which in fact, frequently they did. But in order to become an American, to have consort with, easy relationships with people from other parts of Europe, yeah. the one thing that could unify you is that you were no longer an Italian. Now you're white. That was the unifying stroke. If, if all of those people from Europe, who weren't white in Europe, yeah. but they got white here. And that's, that was the that gave them a unity and, and it gave them a bond with a group. It gave them something that made them that's sorry. It became whiteness as ideology. You know, Arthur Ashe was here, the late Arthur oh, Ashe. Yes. And he said to me, as he had said in one other place, he said in a much quoted comment, he said, <coughs> living with AIDS is easier than living with racism. It's a harder struggle against mm. racism for me mm. than it is against AIDS. What it meant to me is that there's no way for the rest of us to understand that daily encounter. Which brings me to my question to you. Do you still have that encounter? Do you, Tony Morrison, Pulitzer Prize winner, successful, honored in the halls of academe, mm. etc., still have that encounter? Yes, I do, Charlie, but let me add, tell you that's the wrong question. Okay, what's the right question? How do you feel? 
not you, Charlie Rose, but don't you understand that the people who do this thing, who practice racism, are bereft. There is something distorted about the psyche. It's a huge waste and it's a corruption and a distortion. It's like it's a profound neurosis that nobody examines for what it is. It feels crazy. It is crazy. And it leaves, it has just as much of a deleterious effect on white people and possibly equal as it does black people. I always knew that I had the moral high ground all my life. I always thought those people who said I couldn't come in the drugstore and I had to sit in this funny place, I couldn't you go in the park. To them I did. Day one. And I thought they knew that I knew that they were inferior to me morally. I always thought that. And my parents always thought that. But if, if the racist white person, I don't mean the person who is examining his consciousness and so on, doesn't understand that he or she is also a race, it's also constructed. It's also made, and it also has some kind of serviceability. But when you take it away, I take your race away. And there you are, all strung out. And all you've got is your little self. And what is that? What are you without racism? Are you any good? Are you still strong? Still smart? You still like yourself? I mean, these are the questions. It's Part of it is... Yes, the victim, how terrible it's been for black yeah, people. You don't like that. I'm not a victim. I refuse to be one. And the victim is the other person who is morally inferior. And that's what, that's a serious question. To of course. Racism if you to have somehow, the whole, that's a, or his or her own self-esteem and definition. If you can only be tall because somebody's on their knees, then you have a serious problem. And my feeling is white people have a very, very serious problem and so tony morrison in this particular clip is really raising the question that when we talk about racism no matter where you are in the globe south africa in america we're always talking about we have to talk about it and she's suggesting here that white people have a serious problem and they need to figure out what they're going to do about it because all over the globe, black people are standing up in social movements, demanding rights, pressing their governments, and that we're in a fight against white supremacy. And so if we begin to conceptualize and think about racism as a practice, it's, it then helps us to make sense of how a country that's majority black can still be grappling with the legacy of racism. And so oftentimes when we are in South Africa and we're having conversations about race, particularly with, with either white people or colors, there's this idea of, oh, race doesn't matter because we're a majority black country. Yes, white people live here, but we don't have a race problem. It's an economic problem. We cannot separate race out from the economy because the two are highly correlated and they're highly related. But much of what links racial oppression, both in the United States and in South Africa, is this idea that the, that that all of these injustices are rooted into what we call anti-Black racism and also this idea of Afro-pessimism. The pattern of violence against Black people, specifically Black people, is a unique one with both history and implications that will never be comparable to struggles of other communities of color in the United States. And I go further to say globally, institutional racism and discrimination against Black people is evident both in courts, prisons, and our entire justice system. And this is not just exclusive to South Africa, but also exclusive to America as well. Almost at every element of the globe, there has been this disregard for the Black body, for Black excellence, and an attack on keeping Black people oppressed. This particular picture here is a picture of Hector Peterson. And this was a result of the Soweto uprisings uh, in 1976. And this picture, um, if you do research on it, there are different historical accounts of what happened. But the apartheid South African government had issued a decree declaring that all schools would now be would now teach students in Afrikaans. Afrikaans is the language of 
white South Africans. Uh, many of the black South Africans speak multiple languages. They speak their tribal languages and also they speak the languages of other tribes because that's a requirement in terms of what people need to do to communicate. One account tells the story that Hector Peterson had gone to the Soweto uprisings uh, to protest the apartheid government and the protest for a large part was peaceful. There are some accounts which suggest that an officer randomly shot into the crowd, striking the young man. Uh, there are other accounts suggesting that the students did not speak Afrikaans, and so the officers were attempting to communicate with them. At any rate, what is clear from here is what was expressed in the previous slide. And all too often, we've seen multiple examples of Hector Peterson by showing itself as Michael Brown in the US, as Trayvon Martin in the US. And I'm sure there are other unnamed people who were murdered as a result of, of this particular government. But this picture became important because it fundamentally put fire under the apartheid movement in the same way that uh, the uh, attack on civil rights protesters in the United States at the Edmund Peters Bridge did in the US. It was I mean, to look at this picture and see this young, this black man carrying this young boy who has been shot by an officer and to see the rage that his sister who's standing with her hand like this is holding up, you sort of feel, you feel connected to the violence that our people have had to endure globally. And I thought about Emmett Till. You know, I'm a native Mississippian. My grandmother was in Money, Mississippi on the plantation when Emmett Till was abducted and kidnapped. And again, we see in a different country, thousands of miles across the world, this same pain and rage that Black people have been exposed to as a result of white supremacy, as a result of this thing in this craft called racism, right? And so um, it, it sort of speaks to the fact that there's been such a disregard for Black bodies that we become numb to the way in which violence has a psychological impact on our people. Uh, because Emmett Till was also a turning point in the South. It was the first time that the country really, people outside of the South got to see, and I guess on a larger scale, the ugliness of what racism in the South. For those who don't know, the trial for the, for the, the murderers of Emmett Till took place in Greenwood, Mississippi, which is 15 minutes from Mississippi Valley State University. And, and to think that the uncle, Carolyn Bryant, her nephew would essentially become the governor of Mississippi, the immediate past governor, Governor Phil Bryan. Um, and so these are just things I think we should think about. Two recommended readings. I think people, you know, if you're trying to understand these issues, white nationalism, black interests and conservative policy, conservative policy in the black community by Ron Walters and the price of racial reconciliation uh, by Ron Walters. In both of these works, he's grappling with the notion that Th that America is organized around what he calls this equilibrium and that the equilibrium is white governance structures and that any point in time in history where there's been a disruption to the equilibrium, the response from many whites have been a radical form of conservatism that has shown itself in white supremacist movements that have shown itself in the in, in Supreme Court cases uh, that have shown itself in an effort to roll back the progress. Another work we use in this course is The Price of Racial Reconciliation by Ron Walters, where he's talking about reparations in South Africa and the Truth and uh, Reconciliation Commission that provided white South Africans with amnesty. And if we think about this, the notion that under an apartheid government, you could murder, rape, and kill individuals, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission only required you to admit what you've done in exchange for you not going to jail or being punished. And so we think about who does reconciliation re really help? Is reconciliation a thing in the absence of white people giving up property that they haven't really acquired in a correct manner? Um, and this is a, a topic I'm going to return to later because now what's hopeful is South Africa is going through this land debate with the expropriation of land without compensation that's causing a lot of, of debate and many people are suggesting that oh wow this new move by the South African government 
is uh, dividing blacks and whites. I've been to South Africa, I've taught there, blacks and whites are already divided. In fact, in a country where whites are about 11% of the population and they control 80% or 70% of the land, that's a problem. And especially if we think about the ways in which apartheid became distinct and unique in a sense, that it was an attempt to relegate and control almost every aspect of life. Unlike in the US, yes, we had policies that were produced. Yes, there were court cases that were produced that were terrible. But apartheid was structured from the beginning to control the indigenous population of South Africa in almost every aspect. And it says, and I want to share this quote with you. Apartheid is, in other words, a sadist project that attempts to subordinate the whole of his natural populations in all aspects of society of that population to, to, to its self-reproduction of a state. And so if we think about some of the elements that was legislated by government, this is why when people tell Black folk to get over racism, it's important to realize that these were actions that was established by the state. And when I say the state, I'm referring to the South African government. Population registration, the Population Registration Act of 1950, it required South Africans to be classified into one number of a racial population. And this act was the foundation upon which all other racialized policies would be structured. Job reservation and economics, the Mines Worker Act, the Native Building Workers Act, these were all acts that even relegated employment on the basis of race. Segregation in education, uh, the Colored Persons Education Act, the Indians Education Act, um, and even when the government outlawed the speaking of tribal languages, it pissed off South Africans because on the one hand, that may be a small thing, but what do you have when you don't have a connection to your native language? What do you have when you attempt to divorce Black people from their culture? And having been in South Africa, we are a resilient people when it comes to our culture, when it comes to existing in Blackness and also being able to, to just make it and live. Uh, there were land and geographical apartheid. You know, we visit multiple areas there. And even now, we, you know, there's an area called Stellenbosch, which has some of the best wine in the world, actually. Uh, but when you go there, you think about who owns this land. Who owns the, the reserve lands that we go to look at the safaris? And when we think about the shameful legacy of colonialism and imperialism, this land was taken. And so when Tony Morrison proposes the idea that racism is a serious problem and white people need to figure out what to do about it, it requires a conversation and a commitment to what is owed to people who have been disregarded whose land have been taken, whose ancestors have been destroyed, whose con connection to their entire way of life being disrupted. And so moving to the United States in the same way that Jim Crow, that, that apartheid relegated along the lines of race, we also had policies. When we think about the Naturalization Act, when we think about who's a citizen, separate but equal doctrine, you know, separate but equal doctrine uh, became a, 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 a presidents that was abided by in the United States for years. Uh, voting discrimination, uh, uh, segregation in education and public accommodations, uh, even Mississippi Valley State University in its charter uh, was chartered to provide teacher training to Negro educators because they did not want us to attend Mississippi State or Delta State or the University of Mississippi. So much so that the heirs case, and I think the heirs money is running out this year, uh, was, was decided by the United States Supreme Court uh, solely because of these white institutions did not want Blacks to attend. And so when people say move past the vestiges of race and how is it that racism is connected globally, we've got to go back to understanding that the fault line that connects racial oppression between both South Africa and the United States is this question of anti-Blackness. The notion that as Black people, we are not viewed as whole persons, worthy of human dignity, worthy uh, 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 of all the rights and privileges, but we are. And despite the fact that we have been subjected to some of the most undurable forms of horror, we've consistently persist. I want to share just a few slides now that just demonstrates what systemic racism looks like. Uh, this looks at the unemployment rate in South Africa. 
The blue are people who identify as black or African. Color uh, is the darker color, which would be by our measures, either people who are mixed race or of light skin descent. And then there are the Indian Asian population, which some areas of South Africa do have significant populations there, but also the white population. Again, we see black people, 33% unemployment. Coloreds are light skinned, uh, mixed race people 24 is high, but not as high as blacks. And we can spend also time talking about the resentment that these racial categories have set up between both coloreds in South Africa and black South Africans. Um, if we begin to think about um, this, the overall breakdown of the population, 78% of uh, the working age population in South Africa identify as black but only 15% are represented in top management roles. And if we think about 9% uh, colored, about 5% uh, are in management roles. And even when we think about whites, whites constitute 8.7% of the working age population, but 65% of top managers. And if that is a systemic racism, I don't know what is. Looking at uh, other uh, forms, when we think about um, black South Africans account for 78% of the active population. And I think these numbers are simply repeating what the chart showed. Um, even when it comes to wages, black South Africans earn lower wages than when they are employed in contrast to whites who earn substantial higher uh, salaries. Even much of the data shows that white South Africans earn three times more than black South Africans. And again, these numbers are also prevalent in the US, looking at black unemployment versus white unemployment, you know, 16% uh, among black, 12% among whites. Again, blacks disproportionately impacted by unemployment and access to jobs. Uh, even when we look in the US for professional and managerial employment, uh, blacks lag behind both whites and Asians with Hispanic and Latino populations coming in shortly behind African Americans. Uh, even when it comes to political <laughs> even when it comes to political representation in the US, uh, we see that the Congress, while we've been making strides towards becoming more representative, we still lag behind relative to the size of the population. So when we think about moving forward, how do we defeat white supremacy? How do we continue to move forward? We've got to continue to advocate for economic justice, environmental justice, a social policy, continuing to fight uh, political fight for political representation. And again, one of the we talk a lot about the stats and about the current political and social conditions. We don't really talk about the psychological impact of colonialism and racism on people, on black people. Because oftentimes it teaches us to hate ourselves and it teaches us to glorify uh, European cultures. And we've also got to move forward with investments in black communities. So what provides us with some level of, of hope that even in the midst of this, uh, we see South Africa taking a bold step at really talking about the expropriation of land without compensation uh, as a means of restoring uh, or attempting to, to balance the playing field. And you know, whites are saying, oh, they're taking our property, they're taking our land. In many cases, this land was not acquired by generations of white South Africans uh, in a proper manner. Many of them can't produce deeds showing that they really own the land. And, 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 and if we're being honest, uh, the land was taken, it was stolen. Uh, what gives me hope in the US is despite the fact that we are in our own fight for determining what kind of system of government we want to be in, be under no mistake that because the insurrectionists were not successful that their attempts to overthrow our government is done. Uh, but we are still taking to the streets, uh, voting in record numbers. Georgia has, has, has sent two Democrats to the United States Senate. Black people are protesting police violence and demanding economic justice. And so even as we think about all of the, the, even if we think about just how negative racism and white supremacy has been for black people, we have continued to make strides. We have continued to put our best foot forward and we've continued to show the world that we are here to stay and that we deserve to be treated uh, with dignity and respect. Um, talking briefly as I wrap up, we spent a week in Johannesburg where we visit 
uh, the, uh, we visit uh, the Shanty Villages, we visit Constitution Hill, and you really get a, a sense of apartheid not as a thing of the past, but part apartheid as a real human experience that's not so distant. Because when we talk about in Constitution Hill, how political prisoners were fed certain foods and how they fed black men certain foods and put poison in the food in an, uh, in, in an effort to make the black men sterile from being able to produce children. When we talk about the humiliation that black women faced in the prison, even how when they were arrested, they were separated and treated and fed based off of where they fell on the racial structure. My favorite city in South Africa is Johannesburg. I think Johannesburg is one of the most authentic black cities in the world. You see black people who are authentically black, they embrace you, you know, and, and so other areas we visit when we're there, uh, we visit Pretoria. This particular uh, picture is a picture of the Vortreka Museum. And this museum is also known as a temple of white supremacy. It is strategically placed uh, in this location to look down on the city of Pretoria, which is symbolic of white people's belief that they have a design rule by God to rule over black South Africa. And even inside of this particular temple is this racist story about how the white settlers came and they were camping and they were attacked by the Zulus because they were so innocent and the Zulus were digged on the deal and they won the battle. And of course they erected this particular temple to commemorate this, this, um, this, this battle. And when we visit there, I always play devil's advocate. Because my first question is what the hell were white people doing in South Africa during this time for them to even be engaged in a militarized conflict with the natives here? And then the Afrikaans tour guide is typically shocked when I challenge them on that. Um, we also spend time in Durban. This year we went to the Valley of a Thousand Hills uh, to have lunch and allow the students to tour the village. Uh, Durban is a very diverse area. There's a high Indian population and Asian population as well in Durban. Um, and so we spent a couple of weeks, we spent about a week and a half there. Cape Town is my least favorite place. Cape Town is very, very white. Uh, it's very, very racist uh, in terms of what has been my experience there. Uh, but it's also another city we visit as well uh, in Cape Town. Uh, we, we, we've also visited the road. This is a picture here of us at the Rhodes Foundation uh, for presentation that particular day. All in all, uh, trying to understand the global impact of um, white supremacy and the way in which race and racial oppression is inherently connected anti-blackness, anti-blackness, anti-blackness. It is, we have organized a world and a society and government that have been conditioned to treat people differently based off of how much they view a person's humanity. And all too often we have made, or at least society have, 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 have wielded such negative consequences when, with respect to race that it has taught even black people to be skeptical and to get as far away as possible from uh, racism. So this concludes the overarching presentation that we have. I hope that uh, you guys were able to uh, take something or find something interesting from it. Thank you, Dr. Riley, for the fabulous uh, session. Uh, we will now open up for the questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to enter it in the chat window or you can unmute yourself and ask. Please identify yourself before you ask the question. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Uh, Brandon Bigelow, uh, professor at Lincoln University, uh, former Mississippi Valley chaplain. A uh, question for uh, Dr. Riley, a uh, great presentation. What was the religious uh, or the religious uh, influence of South Africa? If you can share it, talk to a little bit of that. Well, of course, uh, with colonialism, there is the influence of Christianity, right, uh, for m many of uh, the white South Africans and also some black South Africans, too. Uh, however, many of the black South Africans continue to practice their tribal religions and their tribal, uh, th their ethnic and tribal traditions and religious practices. Uh, and you also see 
wide diversity among religious practices and beliefs as well. Um, we visited uh, the Valley of a Thousand Hills where we actually talked to the spiritual healers uh, in the Valley of a Thousand Hills who sort of walked us through some of the basics of, you know, how they provide, use the herbs to, to heal and just some of the overall uh, things that, just general things about, just general things about their religious practices. So religion is certainly a, a part of African uh, culture. Uh, we still see the influence of Christianity there, but also too, as we think about colonialism, you know, I'm a Southern Baptist, but something striking was said to me one year while I was there. And uh, one of our tour guides said that when the European settlers came and colonial colonizers came to Africa, black people had the land and the Europeans had the Bible. He said, when they left, white people had the land and black people had the Bibles. And I think that this demonstrates how the conquest of Africa in many regards, especially by European settlers and imperialists, uh, they came under the auspices of Christianity and utilized that as a way to uh, take over the globe. And so even, but again, though, when we talk about, I wanna be clear, I did a lot of talking about racial issues in South Africa, but we're not all that different in the US. In fact, I can take you to places in the US that look like the shanty villages, right? So I, I just wanna make that clear that, uh, you know, I don't wanna be too tough on South Africa because it is a young democracy and a young democracy to be having conversations about the redistribution of land when in America, we barely can even talk about race, uh, I think should be commended. And that is not to suggest that all their issues are, 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 are resolved either. Thank you, Dr. Riley. All right. Any other questions? I'll check the chat to see. Is that all right? I also um, want to. Uh, mentioned as well, when we're talking about South Africa, the racial dynamics are different, right? And so you can, it can be challenging to talk about race to some South Africans because of the way they don't see race as operating. And also there's a tendency to see economic issues completely divorced from race in the same way that the civil rights movement in the US didn't really deal with the economic component apartheid in South Africa really, really failed to deal with the economic component, uh, the abolishment of apartheid and the new Go government later. failed to deal with uh, those issues. I'm over here dozing off, girl. Yeah. All right, were there any other questions? If you have any questions, please feel free to enter it in the chat window or you can unmute yourself and ask. Dr. Riley, I have a question. Uh, can yes. you please, I know in the last uh, slide, you, know, you had pictures of insurrection uh, going on and I know if you, uh, so can you please comment on that? and what is going on in the Senate. What, can you repeat the question real quick? Um, I saw in the last slide, you had pictures of the uh, insurrection, uh, what happened last month here in the United States, you know, um, and uh, the debate, what is going on uh, now at the uh, Senate. Yes, yeah, so January 6th was an interesting day, of course. I'm sure many of you have seen these images that I show here. Uh, where white supremacists took over the United States Capitol. I think one way to explain what we saw happening is white people in America fundamentally see this country as part of their inheritance, and they're willing to destroy it and its institutions if it means the continued degradation and disregard of Black people. Uh, to, see, uh, to see an impeached president send a mob to stop a constitutional process from happening was something I never thought I would see in this country. Uh, as we speak now, the Senate is considering, is, is conducting the impeachment trial of a former president for inciting an insurrection. And it looks like Republicans will acquit him again. But I also think this is part of the larger problem that we have in America, 
with this question of race. I think that in order to understand the rise of Donald Trump, in order to understand the last four years, and even in order to understand just where we are politically now, it we have got to unpack how Barack Obama or Barack Obama's presidency uh, fundamentally disrupted the white governance structure in America. And as Walter say, when that structure is disrupted, the white response in America has always been what? A radical form of a radical reaction. And so we see the, this radicalism taking place in the personification of Donald Trump. Uh, we see it taking place in, a, in, in white senators who are refusing to do their constitutional duty, but also most importantly, what's unique about this new era is we now have people who are racialized practicing what we call multiracial whiteness. People who are not white, but also are part of this new white nationalist movement that we see happening. And, and so I think to understand what's happening here, we've got to understand the way in which white people see America. And so as we think about the protests with George Floyd's death, as we think about the removal of Confederate flags and images, as we think about uh, longstanding norms and traditions changing and the white population uh, dying, what's the white response? It's this radicalism. It's this guy with the horns on his head. It's this guy carrying the Confederate flag up through the United States Capitol. And also to think about Black people and our political conditions in this country, after the riots happened, it was Black janitors who had to clean up the mess behind these white supremacists, which I think is symbolic. I think it was Ayanna Presley who was talking about, you know, this represents a, a, a profound metaphor that Black people in America has made this democracy what it is. It is because of our assertions that we should have a right to vote, that we should have a right to citizenship, that we should have a right to marry who we want to, that we've made this country live up to its democratic ideas. But but like South South Africa, Africa, I'm sorry, but like South Africa, we've yet to get maintain control over the economic component because political power without possession of the economic component is almost useless to some. I don't want to say useless completely, but it, it makes it a little more challenging to real changes that we want to see when we don't deal with economic justice. Thank you, Dr. Riley. You're welcome. You better speak that truth to power, Dr. Riley. God bless you, man. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for tuning in. It's good to see you. Uh, good to see you too, Dr. Riley. All right, good to see a number of faces from Valley uh, that uh, have tuned in. Dr. Jones, the Dean of uh, Student Services. I, I'm so happy that she's here. She was one of my number one supporters while I was uh, at Mississippi Valley. I see uh, B. Bayman, I'm assuming that's Professor Barbara Bayman, uh, excellent professor who uh, I had at Valley. And so it's just great to see everybody here from my Valley family who has logged on. Uh, to just take an opportunity today. Also, one of my fraternity brothers, Billy Benson, and so forth. So I appreciate all of you guys for tuning in. You are so welcome. We hope to have you back soon. Oh, most just call me. <laughs> all right. Oh, love it. Love it. Okay. I mean, if we have any questions or comments, we have a couple more minutes before we wrap up the session. Dr. Riley, thank you again now for joining us for today's global lecture series. It was a fabulous presentation, outstanding. All right, thank you guys for having me. Thank you. Dr. Riley. Yes, ma'am. Please continue on your quest. You were motivational, inspirational. Your passion just came out in your presentation and I'm, I'm hopeful that a number of my students are on this Zoom because this was something they needed to hear as they are preparing to present an informative speech. Thank most you. certainly, most certainly. And I want to encourage students too to also take advantage of the study abroad opportunities. Uh, I have, since I've been at DePaul, I've had the opportunity to do research. I spent a month and a half in Australia I presented at conferences in Spain. I've been to Paris. I've been to South Africa. I've been to a number of different places. And each time I go, it's a unique experience. It's something that, uh, an experience that you really can't buy. But also, most importantly, 
uh, I, I'm also always interested in um, traveling and also seeing the way Black people are treated or, or the way we are, we, 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 are, we are treated in different societies. And it's been, it's been very rewarding and, very, and, and, and it, it's just a beautiful opportunity. I would say take opportunity. There's a world to be seen beyond the Mississippi Delta. And one of the things you discover is that what we see in the Delta isn't all that foreign from what happens in other places. I see a comment in the chat. It says, uh, let me see real quick. It says in South Africa, black people continue to deal with racism, backlash from white people in their country. Oh, absolutely. And in many cases, there is the systemic nature of this oppression, but there's also uh, the, the overt form. I, my colleague, Clarissa, I'm not sure if she's still on. Uh, she published, and Clarissa, you can come off mute if you want to, but um, we were teaching our class and I was talking about white racism and this white woman heard us who was not connected to our course at all. And she walked into the class and proceeded to take over and tell me why, what I was saying was incorrect. And of course I was in a foreign country. So, and I'm from Valley, y'all know how we do at Valley. I went to get her together, but then I had to remember, you don't want to go to jail in this foreign, you don't want to go to jail in this foreign country. So it is unique experiences to see how black people are treated by white folk but it's also unique to see how black people treat us you know we're with 30 white kids and so when we go to a restaurant to 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 eat as a group we're overlooked as the faculty members and oftentimes the the, the black uh waiters will oh you guys have the money okay and they'll come to us so it's this idea too of how how we've also been conditioned to think that white is wealth white is right and we oftentimes overlook, you know, other people. Yeah. Dr. Riley, I, I had the opportunity to live in Gambia for a year and um, uh, I had got connected to some sort of Dutch family. Uh, everybody I went, uh, the majority of people I went from the US were pretty much white. So anyway, we got connected to this Dutch family and they wanted to cook dinner for us. And one of the statements the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the wife of the family made to me, she said, you're one of us. She said, you're one of us and referring to separate me from the Gambian people per se, you know what I mean? So she definitely made that statement. And secondly, I want you to speak to too, uh, sometimes I find that um, African-Americans and, and I think Jeremiah Wright coined this phrase, we're like motherless children in the words of Nina Simone, because sometimes the African doesn't accept us because it's, they say we don't have their culture. So it's like in America, sometimes we seem unaccepted. And then in Africa, because I live there, you've been there sometimes because we don't know the full customs, we're unaccepted. So again, I think it was very Reverend Jeremiah who coined the phrase, we're like motherless children in the words of Nina Simone. Speak to that a little bit for me, I'm sorry. So I do think that the way we set up race, I think you're absolutely correct. Um, the way this is also, I think, a result of white supremacy and, 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 and white supremacy and anti-blackness, because there are Africans who will come to America and will be treated better than African Americans by whites because they're seen as international. And so because you're international, there's a certain privilege that comes with being able to be associated with uh, international privilege, despite the fact that if you look at them, they're black like us, they look like us, they resemble us phenotypically. And so that there is a real tension between Africans and domestic and African Americans. Uh, I'm not sure are you guys for me with the new social media platform uh, Clubhouse, but there was a room between Africans and African Americans, and they were fiercely debating uh, where many Africans, were, and I don't want to say many because this is not research, this is people, you know, individual cases, but the majority of the Africans on the call were suggesting that they were not Black, they were African, uh, and it, it's just an interesting dynamic, and when we begin to look at the grand scheme of things, the way white supremacy work, whether you're light-skinned, dark-skinned, Black, African, Ghanaian, whatever, you're relegated into one category and people and, and society as a whole will treat you like that. See, white supremacy, that's why race is so powerful because it's a social construct. And when you construct things socially, people are rewarded for being a member of the club and people who aren't a member of the club are excluded. And so when you create these categories, these different racial categories, people like to be associated with them. And the further I get away from blackness, the more browning points I get from white people. And I think that we do that in a subconscious manner. 
Clarissa, did you want to jump in and add anything? This is my road dog, y'all. This is my co-author, best friend, mentor. Uh, we published together, we've traveled together, and she also co-teaches our South African course. No, just everything you said is totally on point. Um, if you guys have not been out of the country, if you've not been out of Mississippi, I strongly encourage you to go to another country, in particular a country that has black people there so that you can see, which most countries do, of course, but you can see the way in which race operates across the globe, right? You are hard pressed to find a country where black people are subjugating whites or subjugating anyone else. So um, everything Professor Riley said is absolutely on point. And if we can help you guys in any way with your programs, the faculty or anyone else, please let us know. We'd be more than happy to help you. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. We'll be in touch with both Dr. Riley and you. And I, I wanna add too, because I think Clarissa brought up an interesting point, is as South Africa engages in this land debate, the problem with the land debate is white people are now coming forward claiming to be the victim, claiming to be the victim. And imagine, imagine you've inherited land from your father whose great grandfather stole it from natural inhabit indigenous inhabitants and you can't even produce a deed to the land and yet your people constitutes 11% of the population, but controls over 70% of the land. Now that may be shocking to you, but let me tell y'all a story. What percent of white people own the farmland in LaFleur County? Somebody do their homework, you'll be surprised. In fact, Sharon Wright Austin in her book, Plantation Politics, talks about in Tunica County, Mississippi, one family owns 80% of the farmland in Tunica County. If this isn't economic apartheid in America, I don't know what is. Because Mississippi makes billions from its agriculture industry. Yet when we look at the plight of the Mississippi Delta, I'm from Itabina, right across the street, median income, $14,000. When we look at the plight of the Mississippi Delta, we cannot talk about, we cannot talk about the conditions of black people without talking about what segregation did, without talking about the sharecropping system, without talking about how generations of black folk were, were, were ushered into the sharecropping system. My great grandfather in 19, 1948 left the plantation in Whale, Mississippi to come to Itabina to work as a contractor to build Mississippi Valley. He retired from Valley. And so Valley as an institution has played a unique role in the sense that it has provided economic opportunities for blacks there locally. My grandmother worked at Valley 30 years. My grandfather worked there 30 years, you know? And so when we think about these things, there are starking similarities between the way apartheid has worked and also the same way white, white people have mastered this racist shit in, 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 a very, uh, in a very effective way. And I think that until we deal with it, and it requires, there's a professor at Valley, we went back and forth on Facebook, I think she's a historian, Dr. Catherine Green, I think she was asserting that um, South Africa should be careful about the land debate because they don't want to end up like Zimbabwe. And so my position on that is, White people have had the last forever years to tear up the globe and terrorize. If we make a few mistakes along the way, then so be it. But I also think that it's something profoundly insidious about the fact that in South Africa, there was an attempt to control and reduce the indigenous population of its inhabitants in a way where we were brought to America as enslaved Africans, you know, and essentially channel through that system. Great. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Riley. And thank you all for the wonderful um, conversation. After that, it was fabulous. And um, now, you know, we look forward to continue to work with you, Dr. Riley. And now that we are connected, let's continue to collaborate uh, with Riley. And uh, hopefully, it will benefit both the uh, you know students and faculty on both institutions. Most definitely, and thank you guys for having me today. Thank you.
Have a good day. You too. Good job, man. <laughs> Thank you. We will begin an uh, invitation from Lincoln University as well. Yes, All sir. Right. God Thank bless you. Pennsylvania. That's what Thank you. Ashe. Thank you, Dr. Bigelow. Appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.